Well, greetings, everyone. This is David Arendale, and I'm sharing with you a recording of a webinar which I conducted with the New York College Learning Skills Association in April. And what I want to try to share with you is what it is that I've been learning about race, the intersection with learning assistance, and what are some lessons that might be useful. One of the things I want to emphasize to you is that I created a website in order to be able to share a lot more resources than I have time to do during our session today. And you see that located here. That website is still going to be active for the foreseeable future. So I highly encourage you to take a look at that website Frankly, half the value out of the webinar is through things I don't even have time to be able to share. So I hope you consider checking that out then. It's important to acknowledge where did I learn all of these things that I have to share with you. Well, first grew up up there were people who taught me a lot, and that was my students who served as my students in my global history course, my undergraduate, my graduate teaching assistants. They're located up there. Also, we'll see a shout out to some of the NYSLA members who I'll have an opportunity to share some of the things that they wanted to have uh, about how they're already implementing ideas that are inside of this webinar. There's one group here I think it's really important to mention, and that's this Colleagues of Color for Social Justice. We'll see the website address for them coming up again. If you end up going to the website, as I showed you on the previous slide, there's a link to that. This is a group of more than 50 uh, colleagues of color from across the United States who have been working with me uh, and giving me the opportunity to learn from them and also for us to collaborate together on a number of really important publications. And we're going to talk about those coming up here in just a moment. It's important to recognize all of the expertise inside of NYSLA, and it's already obvious from the conversations I've had monitoring what was going on during the chat room that they have a lot of information to share. This is a group that shared comments with me in a really simple survey of how are you already implementing in some way diversity, equity, and inclusion in your developmental level courses, your learning centers, your tutoring programs, your uh, small group um, uh, study group programs like supplemental instruction and such. Well, these individuals had some really valuable insights, and we're going to see them mentioned as we go through this webinar. There's also uh, some other additional resources uh, that each one of the campuses inside of New York have already implemented in order to help the faculty and the staff members to implement DEI. This is just simply one website here from one of the uh, schools within the Syracuse University system, that link is to this website. This link is in that uh, general resource web page that I talked about on the very first slide. So in case we went by that all too quickly, just make sure to either scroll back to that first slide or really uh, be attentive to the very last slide in the presentation webinar because I'll also have that same uh, link to all of these other resources. Well, what we have here is what it is that we're going to be trying to work on for today, and that is we're going to be looking at language a great deal. And you can see up there, we're going to start off with DEI definitions. So we have kind of a working vocabulary. Then we'll end up looking at a statement. And it's something that most campuses probably already have done, but maybe not. So maybe there'll be something new to learn from there. Then we're going to take a look at campus culture and find out what is it that has an influence. And one of the things that I'll have to share with you, the biggest threat to campus culture is racism. So we'll end up talking about that coming up. Then we'll end up taking a look at some more definitions. 
This time we'll be focusing on anti-racism, which would be what are actions that you can take in order to battle racism. Then we'll end up taking a look at some examples of anti-racist behaviors and policies and practices for you can implement with your tutoring programs, uh, your small group learning programs, the classroom, or the learning center itself. And then we'll finally finish up by looking at what are some additional resources that you might find helpful as you continue to implement DEI inside of your program. So obviously there'll be a lot of conversation today about how race intersects with our topic this is just simply a word cloud, and where's this come from? Well, this one, the word cloud, comes from a glossary of anti-racism definitions that I'm going to note here in just a second. One of the things I thought was important as I was thinking about this webinar was what is the work that's already been going on inside of our learning assistance and developmental education programs? And as you'll notice, I'll not end up reading all the words on PowerPoint slides in case I roll along a little too quickly, hit the pause button. But is this the things that I was thinking about was what kinds of programs that we manage? And then I thought about who are the students who we're serving, who have little to no social capital. I know what that's like. I'm a first-generation college student. I had well-intentioned parents, but they really didn't know how to be able to help me. I was really fortunate. I was able to find resources when I went to my undergraduate college. But you think about how many students don't have those kinds of resources. And then that final bullet point down there at the bottom even though there's been some really good work that has been going on, we all have an opportunity to learn more in order to get better at what we're doing. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first element of our webinar, which are DEI definitions. So many of these, and as I said, this particular uh, document here. Uh, it's the Colleagues of Color for Social Justice, Anti-Racism Glossary for Education and Life. The link is found uh, there at that final website page. And you see this curious little icon here. Whenever you see this on a page, realize there's a web link to this resource on that web page that I was talking to you about. Once again, not going to take a look at and read all the words, but just simply wanted to focus on three words, and that was diversity. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the different personal and group characteristics, and there's lots of those for a diverse population. And then you see some of the examples here. We've moved much beyond just simply talking about the first element, of race, gender, and age, but also the less obvious ones. And you can see a list of them that are all up here. That is part of the richness which brings our campus to a more rich learning environment, but we gotta have a space to where students feel comfortable to be able to talk, and also we have a learning environment that's gonna be conducive for them. Equity, well, it is really focused on equal outcomes. That's the biggest move, I think, in the language here. It used to be you saw a lot of emphasis talking about equality, which means that the group or individuals have the same resources or opportunities at the beginning. And whenever you talk about equity, we're looking at the outcomes. What's happening at the far end? I think about institutions over in Great Britain. They actually measure whether the diversity of the incoming class of students is fairly well representative of the students who are graduating. And if it's not, and if it's primarily the dominant population or the ones that are graduating, well, then the funding for the institution can be reduced. So they have really have taken this much, much more seriously than here in the States. And then the word inclusion. 
Well, it's this word here talking about a climate that fosters belonging, respect, and value for everyone. And we're going to be talking about particularly this word here, belonging, coming up in just a moment. Because if students don't have a sense of belonging, then they're probably not going to do as well in school. And there's a higher likelihood that they're going to switch majors to something else or they're going to withdraw out of the institution. So now let's go ahead and take a look at a DEI statement. One of the things that I did is I got really curious because it seems like everyone is talking about what is their DEI statement, and you'll also notice other words are being added to that as well. But just for, uh, for this webinar, I'm just going to focus on DEI. Well, what are the elements that go into them? Well, they tend to have some sort of a headline title that kind of grabs your attention. Something that's more than just simply the DEI statement. It's like, what's the headline? What's the main point? There's some sort of vision statement inside of there. There's some uh, benchmarks. And the idea is that you got to keep it short. I mean, you could end up writing taking a look at your vision and your benchmarks, well, that could end up being many, many pages, which is not a bad thing. That's part of a strategic plan that is important to give guidance. But you need to be able to have something that is short in length and also is very short on jargon. And let me just give you an example of one here. We are better together. Where does this statement come from? Well, it actually comes from a variation of a statement that I was drafting up for another group that I'm working with in terms of some documents. And what I did is I tried to take the elements from the title, the vision statement, the benchmarks, and keeping it relatively short, well, this is what we came up with. Our mission is to help students excel in learning. Embracing DEI is a necessary part of the culture. The collective sum of our individual differences, I thought that was a really an important phrase there, of our individual differences, makes us stronger through eliminating barriers and implementing evidence-based best learning practices. It's an ongoing process to enact a culture of DEI within our schools that identifies the barriers based on bias, racism, organizational structures that support the same. We foster a learning environment that celebrates social justice and inclusive learning, which leads to higher student achievement and personal success. My question for you is, how are you using those kinds of statements uh, inside of your learning center or tutoring program or such? Well, here's an example from uh, State University of New York at Plattsburgh. This is what Karen is doing. She ends up emphasizing the statement. It isn't something that just appears a single time in the annual report. They talk about it on a monthly basis. And they continue to talk about their commitment to DEI and anti-racist work. It's more than just simply avoiding racism. It is being anti-racist, which means are we creating a learning environment that is conducive for no matter what your racial background is? That's a really important statement. So my suggestion for you is to consider homework. And the deal is, lots of us have DEI statements, but where does it appear at? Is it appearing on the wall of your learning center? Is it in your syllabus? Do you have it on bunk, uh, bookmarks that you hand out? Um, how is it that you're making this visible to your students? And here is the second um, question, and that is, who should be involved in writing and revising it? I don't have an answer for you on that. That's a thought question. So once again, two thought questions for you to consider. Well, now let's go ahead and take a look at campus culture. We've kind of looked at the words. Now let's start looking at the culture in which the students are learning.
or not. So what is it that we already know about campus culture? Well, the student has an enormous number of influencers, and this is just a small example of that. Actually, one of the best studies out there was done by Alexander Aston. What happens in college? It actually dates back to research studies back in the 1980s and 1990s, and the national studies. These involved hundreds of thousands of students, and they were looking at hundreds of variables that had an impact upon students. Here are just a few. And I just simply wanted to emphasize, well, peer-assisted learning and tutoring programs can have such a big impact. But also you see that the, obviously the instructors have an impact, but you think about all the other uh, of these, and this is just a small list, because Alexander Aston talked about how many variables had an impact upon students in college. It was 100 plus variables. I just simply wanted to emphasize this as we're talking about campus culture. Campus culture, well, what is it? Well, it is another way of talking about a campus culture. It's what they call a moment of truth. This actually goes back to uh, some literature uh, that came out of the 1980s and 1990s about customer service. This is the classic book. And I highly recommend it for you. And think about how you could apply this to your learning center, tutoring program, or inside of your classroom. And what they said was that customers, because that's what their focus was. This was a, um, a commercial application. I'm just simply saying that we can make an educational application of this. A moment of truth is a specific event in time whenever the student comes into contact with some element of the college experience, whether that be their experience during a tutoring session, what happened in a single class period, what happened to them whenever they were going through the bookstore, what was their experience inside of the residence halls, all of these. Every single time that the student comes into contact with one of these moments of truth, they evaluate whether the price that they're paying, either time or money, equals or exceeds the value of what they've been promised. And what's the result? Well, if the negative experience is there, they're going to be diminished in their ability to learn as well, and they're going to think about leaving the institution. That's the reason why these moments of truth and the issue about there are moments, and it's accumulation of these moments that has such a big impact upon students. That's the reason why we'll see coming up here in a couple of minutes the definition for microaggressions. Well, it's the accumulation of these microaggressions that can lead students to basically see the institution, the campus culture, as racist. One relationship can make the difference for students about their connection to the campus culture. And the thing that was really fascinating from this research comes from the Noel Levitz people, and that is that it doesn't really make a difference who it is. They could be their roommate, they could be a classmate, they could be an instructor, an advisor, someone who works in the food service or somewhere else. That's the reason why the campus culture is impacted with so many variables on the student. And all of those things has a pretty complex soup for students to be immersed inside of. And it helps to explain part of the reason why some students don't stay at the institution, because for them, the accumulation of those moments of truth are too negative to stay for. Now, most of us have probably have seen uh, or read things by Vincent Tinto, or at least you've seen him cited in articles. He's probably one of the most influential researchers for helping to explain why do students drop out of college? 
And this is a real classic PowerPoint slide that I have been using for decades and decades. I used to do lots of presentations about the Supplemental Instruction Program, and I shared with people who were listening about why was it that Supplemental Instruction was helpful. And there's lots of other programs that are also helpful too, by the way. But I oftentimes kind of tended to focus up here at the top with these about students are having uh, difficulty levels inside of their courses or what they see uh, in the textbook, what the professor is saying in the classroom and what they're understanding, well, they don't end up relating to each other. That's called incongruence. And if you have uh, a lot of incongruence, you may end up giving up. And that's the reason why Tinto said, for most students who are going to drop out, they drop out within the first six weeks of the academic semester of their very first year in college. They're making decisions, those moments of truth. They're deciding whether or not this is a good place for them to be at. One of the things that I think that I overlooked too much were these bottom three down here. Difficulty making an adjustment to the campus culture, they're being socially isolated. They're really not interacting with others. They're just staying inside of their apartments or their residence hall rooms. They're not really interacting with other people on campus. They're not being very involved with other campus activities. They're really isolated. And also, they hang out with a social group that really doesn't have a priority for getting higher grades in classes. Well, what I better understand is I need to think about all six of these themes up here and understanding why it is that students stay or they drop out. Well, what is it that binds us together? What's in the middle of this here whenever you're talking about belonging? So during the webinar, I asked people to talk about inside of a discussion group how is it that they developed a sense of belonging for students and staff? They talked about orientation programs. They talked about coming in to the school two or three days early, participating in activities. It was interesting. They said while there was lots of activities for the students, there weren't as many activities for the faculty members, and there was actually no activities for the staff members. They were just kind of hired in and they were just supposed to somehow meet and to um, immerse themselves in the campus culture and just treat it like a job and that would be sufficient. And what they pointed out was that the faculty, the students, and the staff all need to develop a sense of belonging. And they had a chance to talk about that in their small group. I talked about Vincent Tinto in a previous slide. Well, here's a summary of what he's been doing in the past two decades. After spending the first part of his career identifying the problem of students dropping out, he started talking about solutions. And what he found was that if people don't see themselves as members of a supportive community filled with students, faculty, and staff, and they don't value them, well, they're not going to stay at the institution. There's daily interactions that are going on. There's a positive campus environment. They perceive the college as a welcoming and has a culture of inclusion. Learning takes place in communities. That's the reason why he talked about uh, it was so important to have learning communities embedded in to courses, particularly in the first two years of college, and also that the curriculum was relevant for them. What we have found out from looking at the research is that the biggest threat to belonging is racism. And that can either be experienced with a single moment of truth. All it takes is one statement by the professor or one statement by another student, that can be enough to lead students to feel like they don't belong at the institution. 
And it's more than just the absence of racism. It is something to where we are creating an anti-racist environment that is supportive of all students, regardless of their racial, cultural, diverse backgrounds. The reason why I think this topic is so important is because of the people who are probably watching this video. You probably run developmental level courses, tutoring programs, peer study group programs, learning centers. We're on the front lines of establishing a positive and inviting campus culture. Where the first contact points were probably conversations are taking place. Because there's too many students who go into classrooms, silently sit, take notes or not, and then leave and never have a conversation with anybody else. And that's the reason why that is such a threat for students of not having a positive, supportive environment. Or the way that the teachers are teaching the course is not supportive. There is a really important article which I'd highly recommend for you to get, and it's this one. Incentives and Barriers to Participation in the PLTL uh, Learning Working Spaces and Exploration of Underrepresented Student Experiences. This particular article found that when looking at students of color who are participating in a study group program, they found out there was lots of examples of it not being a helpful environment. It was detrimental for these students. While they were thankful that the institution took the time to provide the resource, it could have been better. And it identifies 24 different practices that could be done in order to make that learning environment more supportive. I highly recommend it. It may cost you $35 to download this if you can't get the article through your interlibrary loan or your library doesn't have a, an electronic subscription to the journal. But I highly recommend this for you. Well, we've been talking about campus culture. Now let's take a little deeper dive into these anti-racism definitions and then we're going to be getting up in the next point then is, well, what's the solution? How should we be behaving? As I said for you, um, two resources that are available through the website. One of them is Anti-Racist Activities and Policies for Student-Led Study Groups. It's about 35 pages long. I had the privilege of working with about a dozen colleagues of color on developing this particular document. And it's a practical way of looking at what kinds of behaviors and policies should guide a study group program. Another thing that I'd highly recommend that you maybe take a look at, and that is the glossary itself. And it has 48 um, definitions. And the thing that I think is a little unique about the contribution from this group is that not only do you have the definitions, and there's lots, uh, if you do a quick Google search, there's many, many uh, anti-racism glossaries that are available. The thing that is unique about this one is that it provides examples. And some of them are really painful examples that the uh, co-authors of the glossary, all of which were people and colleagues of color, share about their own personal experience. So it was a painful document for many of the co-authors to work on, but I think it is really helpful, and I hope that you might take a look at that. Well, what are, you know, as I said, there's 48 definitions. I'm going to end up kind of focusing us on a couple of them. One is anti-racism. It's where you actively oppose racism by advocating and taking action to change the education, political, economic, or social life. So we're going to start talking about here now is what are some ways that we could actually do something to make a difference? Climate, structural racism, 
but I'm going to have us take a look at this definition here, and that's microaggression. Microaggressions, according to our group, Colleagues of Color for Social Justice, we looked at the professional literature and we identified there's really actually at least three manifestations of microaggressions. Microassault is an explicit racial derogative by verbal or nonverbal attack meant to hurt, cursing another person, using derogatory terms. Then there's micro-insults, and these are communications that are rude and are insensitive and demean a person's racial heritage or identity. So these are a little more subtle, but they're still as painful, as negative, and contribute to a negative campus culture and really kind of leads to students deciding whether or not to stay or not. Micro-invalidations, well, these are communications that exclude, negate, or nullify the psychological thoughts, feelings, or experiential reality of a person of color. For an example, for here, it's using so-called jokes. Well, they're not really jokes. They really are racist statements, but... If the other person expresses it in a sense of humor or with some laughter and say, well, I was just joking. Well, no, it's not. The thing about microaggressions is that they are cumulative. Now, a single one is deadly, but the accumulation of these over a lifetime and I think that this is part of what I've been learning as a white male, is that I don't experience microaggressions. I either am not attentive enough to what other people say to me, or two, um, it doesn't have the impact on me because it's not something that's been cumulative. I've not been living. This is not a lived experience. There's no way that I can know what it's like to be a black person in America. I can read. I can listen. I've learned a great deal from my colleagues. I can read books, watch movies, watch documentaries. Uh, I can learn a lot more, but I never can really know what it means to have to deal with microaggressions. And that's the reason why I thought that was an important concept I wanted to get across in the webinar for people to think about, well, what are examples of microaggressions that you have witnessed? And boy, the discussion was really rich. They talked about statements that were made, uh, attitudes of being demeaning towards other people, being condescending towards other people. Those things are deadly poisons inside of the education environment. Here in America, we're making progress, but we have so much more to go through. So once again, this was really a rich discussion that occurred amongst the members of NYSLA. Well, now we've been talking about definitions. Well, now we're finally up to, well, okay, what is it that we ought to be thinking about and doing? Once again, another document that's available for you. I have a 100-page document that's available for you through the website. And this is a document that has embedded best practices of anti-racist practices and policies into an overall guide for what we call course-based learning assistance. It's a generic term for small group discussion uh, study group programs like peer-led team learning, like structured learning assistance, like supplemental instruction, or you name your study group program, these could be really helpful. And the thing that's important is that while I may have served as editor of this thing, it was 50 plus people colleagues across the United States who run their own peer learning programs contributed the practices that are inside of this document. 
So I highly recommend that you check it out. And as I said, we've inserted into this document new anti-racist practices and policies. Just to make sure that if you take a look at this document, it's not meant to judge existing programs. It's to provide some guidance. No one has enough time, money, resources, you name it, in order to implement everything. So many people in our profession do more than just run a tutoring program. Chances are you're a good person, you are a good program manager, and you get rewarded at your institution by being given more work to do. It's the oddest thing. We reward people who are doing well by giving them more without necessarily a big increase in salary and also not giving them more people and time in order to be able to do it all. Well, that's a webinar for another discussion. But I just simply wanted to make sure if you take a look at this document, the expectation is that not anyone would implement every single thing. Consider it a menu book and select menu items that make sense for you. Now, whenever I talk about examples, I'm going to be drawing out of this uh, peer study group um, document. And you'll see the words leader and facilitator used often. Well, this talk is intended for all four of these groups down here. So please just realize, substitute other words whenever you see some of the examples. Well, it's important to have a mission and goals. Well, the question is, in the stated mission and goals for your program, do you explicitly say that your, your goal is to equal or exceed, exceed the institutional diversity in your program? And also, are you talking with students of various racial backgrounds to get feedback from them and their concerns? And then also, how are you integrating issues of race, gender identity, sexual identity, and all the rest inside? This is just simply we're trying to get at, are you making this a priority in your program? Now, once that, well, first of all, let's give the example here from Ulster uh, County Community College. They talk about how it's very explicit that their academic support is for all diverse student needs and challenges. And one of the things that I notice with many of the people inside of NYSLA, they talk about this diversity here in terms of first generation, neurolinguistic diversity, uh, more than just simply racial and gender and the rest. So it's expanding our vision of what does the word diverse really mean. Now, after you end up setting all of these priorities for serving a more diverse uh, population, and in fact, uh, your goal is to service at least, if not exceed, the diversity of your institution, then you have to go and have to assess it. And that is, well, who's participating in your program or in your class? And are you measuring that by gender identity and by race then? So we need to find out, are we actually meeting our objective that was off the previous one then? And then also we're looking at the immediate student outcomes. You know, are we uh, looking at the students who participate in our programs? Do you separate out the data by gender identity and by race? And... Are you seeing equal outcomes? That's whenever you start talking about equity because it's more than just simply um, equality that you offer a service for students. The question is, is equity. Are the different types or categories or descriptions of students, are they all um, achieving higher outcomes? And if we don't have them being served, and if their outcomes are not equal to or maybe even exceed that of the white population, 
then there's that's a place for you to think. Something is amiss. So there's much, much more inside of that 100-page document. My goal here is I'm just simply trying to give us some examples. So one of the questions was, not only how are you measuring diversity of students served with whatever program that you're offering, but the second question is almost as important as the first one. Well, who is it that sees this diversity report? And who should see this? You know, whenever I worked at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, I was responsible for a lot of things other than supplemental instruction. We had a really robust, comprehensive learning center. And each year we had an annual report. And that annual report went to the vice chancellor of academic affairs, student affairs, we also made that available to the deans of the academic colleges that we served. And in addition to all of that, we also had our own advisory board. So they would end up seeing that. Now that's a way to help make yourself responsible to a larger group. Also, that also gives you the opportunity to go back to these people and ask for resources. Because you can't ask a program to achieve some level of outcome if you don't have the resources. And how is it that we're going to communicate what it is that we're doing if we're not making this information on an annual basis available to the big policymakers on campus? So something else for you to consider. In terms of the learning environment, the questions are, and once again, some of these are coming right out of that research study that looked at the students of color involved in that study uh, group uh, program, uh, the PLTL program, which could have had been a SI program or an SLA program or whatever. I'm not picking on the PLTL people. I'm just thankful that someone did a really hard-nosed qualitative research study that asked students what was their experience. And frankly, that's whenever you get to really some of the best information about what's going on with students rather than always just simply looking at it as a quantitative study that looks at the average grades received by different um, racial groups. Well, let's actually get in there and ask the, ask the students what their experience is. So let me just give you some examples up here. Um, leaders avoid, once again, these are the study group leaders, avoid words and behaviors that demonstrate their own academic prowess and social capital. It's really tempting for these study group leaders to talk about how smart they are. They're in uh, degree programs. They all plan to be engineers, doctors, scientists, and all the rest. Uh, they talk about how um, they have a 4.0 GPA. Um, school is pretty easy for them. Well, those things may all be true. I have no doubt. But the problem is, whenever you end up talking about that, you set up a real dichotomy between you as the leader and the students who are in your study group program who are struggling. Because they start to think that there's something wrong with them as students because they struggle. Another one is, what kinds of learning activities do you have going on during your study group sessions? And the question is, is how do you handle competitive learning activities, which tend to be one of the most popular things that goes on during uh, small group uh, study groups, is that there's competitions for solving problems and then quickly going on to the next problem and solving that and then somehow recognizing people who get the correct answers the fastest. And you may even give them treats or something or other. I mean, that happened at my institution. We're, we're not the only ones that would hand out inexpensive candy to people for their performance during study group sessions. And you can say, well, David, you're being awful harsh on this. The question comes down to what are we communicating to the students who are struggling inside of the study group session? Maybe they've struggled their whole time in life. 
And now all of a sudden, I've been thrown into a place to where I'm publicly shamed because I'm not the one solving the problems the fastest. So how can we have competitions? Well, we can have anonymous competitive activities. What students told me was they ended up using something that was called Jamboard, which is a free app, and it allows you to be able to have competitions, but do so anonymously then. Leaders are careful not to send the message that the issues, readings, and materials, they're easy. Well, that's going to be really tough on students who find it difficult. Remember one of the uh, issues that uh, Tinto talked about? He talked about incongruence. If I get some misspelled words, please give me some grace on that. Well, that's part of what goes on with incongruence because material's hard. A-plus students find it easy, particularly for the introductory courses. You know, um, that's, that's good for them. But if you communicate that message to everybody else inside the session, you're trying to ram them through with competitive activities. You're telling them how smart you are up here. Uh, we are communicating these are easy materials. One of the very best things that you can do as a study group leader, a tutor, or an instructor is to share your own challenges that you've had and also how you have struggled with course material. The messy process that it takes to solve a problem. I did this in my um, introductory global history course. I would share with the students that my grades weren't so hot coming out of high school. And very well, I might not have been admitted to the University of Minnesota. For me, I found it funny that I got into a place that maybe wouldn't admit me as a student, but hired me as a professor. Well, a lot happened between coming out of high school and then finally whenever I was selected to come up here to the university. But the issue is I'm talking to him about how I struggle. The students loved that whenever I talked about that. I would talk about how I didn't know if I really belonged in higher education or not. A lot of our students have that feeling that they don't belong. That there's a sense that it's kind of I'm waiting for disaster to come as a student because I really didn't know whether I really belonged here or not. Um, it's negative stereotyping of myself. Uh, I am isolating myself from others because I'm afraid to disclose what I don't know. For an instructor who's willing to be able to do these kinds of things, you make your class much more accessible. And the same thing can be done by our tutors. Um, um, Kathleen uh, from State University of New York, uh, Genesee, talked about how she wanted to make her class more accessible. So after coming out of the pandemic where it forced everyone to have Zoom, she was going to add and continue to keep Zoom as a um, resource that students could join the class either in person or through Zoom. That's making a classic more accessible for students, regardless of why it is that they're choosing to make that. I did the same thing in my history course. I recorded all of my class lectures and put them all up on the web. In fact, if you wanted to see my class, you can actually go to my website, erindale.org, and uh, do a search for global history. Uh, there's search uh, boxes located everywhere, and you can actually see uh, what my lectures look like. I actually kind of turned them into modules, and I found that students found it more helpful if they could make a choice on whether they were coming to class or they were watching it on video, or whenever they had to miss class, that they didn't simply have to try to borrow someone else's lecture notes, but rather they could 
in a sense, shared the same experience, even though they missed out on the interactions with other students, while well, they would be able to actually hear me and see what it was that I was sharing. Karen here talked about how we're going to continue to work on our blind spots and our respective privilege. I mean, I think about that. I finally understand what white privilege is about um, better. But we're all in, as she talked about at her institution, as the saying goes. At NASA, David talked about how he changed his curriculum to make it more relevant, and he had more time to talk about issues of race, gender, cultural poetics, cultural materialism, disability studies to the interpretation of uh, literary text. That's whenever you start talking about something that is much more about the diversity of students, the way they think, and that they interact with them. So one of the uh, discussion questions that I had, uh, one was how can you uh, make your class more um, or make your study group sessions, um, how can you provide for anonymous competitions, there's also this question here, and that is, how can you display academic humility during a class session, whether it be tutoring, small group discussion, or an actual classroom taught by an instructor? How can you display humility? So as we have these discussion questions, as we go through this recording, think about just hitting the stop button and thinking about that question before you move on to the next one. Well, this one is one that really gets to the nitty-gritty, and that is what kinds of specific actions are you taking while planning the session or during the session to combat racism? Boy, I hope you, you'll hit the pause button and think about that, because one of the challenges is for white faculty members or white study group or tutors, and particularly if they're white males, to think about this question here. Now, if you are a student of color, this one is a lot easier to deal with because this is part of their lived experience. But think about this on basis of what we've talked about thus far. Take a look at that glossary the anti-racism glossary for education and life, and I think that that will help give you more specifics about what are the things that you need to combat regarding racism, about voice, about pacing of the class, about your choice of words, your choice of learning activities, about how you handle students who may make microaggressions inside of the class session, do you just let it slide or do you find a way to intervene at that moment and say that was not acceptable? I mean, that takes some real gumption for you as the faculty member to not let the thing slide. Well, uh, once again, we're talking about how do you interact inside of your class sessions, study group sessions, or whatever. How is it that you move the group forward after all students successfully solve the problem? This was one of the biggest problems that I found with supplemental instruction programs because they were so tempted to get into this competition, and they thought, the leaders thought, well, if they can experience as many problems as possible within a 60-minute period, that would be good for them. Well, actually, more is not better. Actually, less is better because we make sure that everyone is going to solve the problem. Not only that you solve the problem, but also you understand the process to solve. I mean, this, this issue about finding the correct answer is so difficult 
because it's so tempting for students to think that's what's supposed to be happening during these tutoring sessions and study group programs or you name the environment. They think that finding lots of right answers is the best thing. Well, it's not. It's really important to make sure that everyone is working together. Uh, waiting requires that the a leader has got to read verbally and non-verbally what's going on with the students inside of the class. But also, you don't want to embarrass students. And that's the reason why cutting down on the number of problems that are being solved, making sure that students are working in small groups and that you rotate those small groups because cliques can form inside of study group programs where the same students study together and they want to work together. Well, you can't let them do that. you got to rotate the groups up, or else you're going to find the students who are getting the B pluses and A's are working together in smaller groups, and then everybody else is struggling. Well, we just can't allow them to do that. Also, making sure that one or small group of students dominate the conversation. That's the reason why it's critical that the leader of those groups rotates the voices, put different students up at the marker board, have them work in small groups. And if the same student wants to give an answer the next time that you have the discussion, say, well, thanks, uh, Ahmed or Frank or Lucinda. Uh, you got to share last time. Let's have someone else new this time share. And you just simply need to find a way to get more voices. And how is it you're going to have more comfort inside of the sessions? Well, you actually are going to need to have them working in groups of two or three so they can rehearse themselves before they're ever going to feel comfortable in talking in front of a big group then. Because nobody who is a struggling student wants to publicly document that they get wrong answers. We've got to make an environment that is safe and supportive so that any student can participate then. So once again, we had another discussion period inside of the webinar. How do we make sure everyone understands before you move forward? And also, how do you manage talkative participants then? So make sure that you have some answers for those before you go to... Uh, um, unpause your video in order to look at the next one. What are we doing in terms of the professional development of the leaders? Well, there's lots of things up here. We're doing probably a lot more about cultural competence. Um, we can also talk about discussions about race during the sessions. We can end up doing lots of in-services. One of the best things that I would share with you is something we did with our prayer learning program at the University of Minnesota was reflection time. Having all of our study group leaders having blog postings that they had, and these were private. These were private blog postings that only I, as the head of the program, would have, be able to see and for me to, to respond to. And I would give them questions for them to reflect about. And one of those would be in terms of what's going on with students who are struggling inside of your class? What are you inside of your session? What are you doing? What have you noticed about um, issues of students interacting among different racial groups inside of your group? Getting the students to actually take time to write is so important. In fact, I learned that finally inside of my history course, I finally started converting some of my more traditional uh, ways of assessing students and putting more writing in. Students liked it, but the key is if you're going to have reflections, then whoever is reading those have got to respond to them. One of the worst things is for students to think they have busy work. And they're just responding to a blog posting, and nobody ever gives them any reaction. One of the things that I was able to do finally in my last couple of years of teaching my history class is I moved to more reflection, 
was that the more that I gave them feedback, and the students told me, said, we haven't had this same experience in some of our other classes, and we like this. We like getting more feedback because we just don't know how we're doing. Um, this is an example of a professional development that's going on. Uh, Chelsea's talking about power dynamics inside of tutoring sessions. And I don't know all the detail of what she means by power dynamics, whether she's talking about differences uh, of race or is it gender identity. I don't know, but what I do know is that she's taking her training with her tutors to a much higher level. And then Karen here was talking about how important it was for her to take everything that she's learning inside of all of these diversity, cultural competence, professional development sessions. She's conceptualizing how is it that we're taking that and then how am I infusing that into my peer tutoring program. In terms of the leadership of the program, whether it be the tutoring program or the study group program, the question comes down to who picks the leaders of the tutoring and the study groups? And that is the program administrator has got to make the final decision, not faculty members. Now, faculty can recommend students, and we're going to see a couple of slides here. This is probably some of the more uncomfortable material inside of this um, because it's making a basic challenge that faculty members are not always the best judges for who ought to be tutors, and we'll see why here coming up in a second. We've got to make sure that the program administrator is making those final decisions. Faculty, they can nominate and they can recommend, but you just can't let them make the final selections. So a discussion question was, what are the desirable traits that you want to look for whenever you're hiring a new study group facilitator or tutor? So just stop for a moment, if you like, before we go to the next couple of slides. Once again, here's a slide with a lot of words on it. I'm not going to read all of those here. But it's talking about what are some of the things that you'd like to see in an ideal um, tutor or small group discussion leader. Well, this is the kind of stuff that we started training people at the National Training Center in Kansas City for supplemental instruction. We said that it isn't always an A student. It can be a B-level student, and oftentimes we want students that have had to face challenges and has patience to help other students be, able to be successful. And then you see all the other items that are here. It is not that they are miniature professors. They're not teaching assistants. But you can see some of the other things, and it's also important down here, that the facilitators need to reflect or exceed the demographics of the student body. It's too easy for instructors to always select the A or the A-plus students. They tend to select students who sit on the front row of the classroom. They tend to pick people who they've had conversations with. And these A or A-plus students, they tend to be the ones that go down and see the professor uh, and talk uh, before, during, and after, and they also show up at their instructor uh, office hours. And often they share the exact same demographic background. There's nothing wrong with these students. Please make sure that you understand what I'm saying. But there's other issues that I think are more important for creating a positive learning environment for all students inside of the class, regardless of their racial background, regardless of their level of academic preparation. Uh, 
Um, once again, I could have used this slide here by Chelsea in another place, but I was just really thinking about this one is on how widely she sees the issue of diversity. And I thought that that was really a growth area that I think the field has moved in a great deal. So that's been really good. And I just thought that I would just place that one there. Um, in terms of, there's a whole section inside of the guide that talks about ethics, opportunity, diversity, and inclusion. And basically what I was trying to get across, and this is what the team was trying to build, is that what is it that we're doing in order to make sure that we're portraying diversity and all the materials that we're using? We're also asking for our facilitators to also learn a little bit of information about their students in the class. And that could be a survey that you hand out on the very first day of class. And maybe the questions could be, um, are you the first generation in your family to go to college? Or what are your sports background? Uh, what are your college interests? It's somehow trying to help set up a bridge between you as the instructor or the study group leader or the tutor. How are we developing a bridge between you and the students? So that was part. Once again, this guide is a hundred plus pages. We're talking about well over probably 150 to 200 suggestions of things that you could do with your program. At Niagara, um, uh, Sharon talked about how she did something that moved even further along. Not only was she making sure that her writing course materials had authors of color, and also that she prompted uh, thoughtful discussions about race in class. And that's whenever you really have embraced DEI and you are really trying to make a more inclusive classroom environment. It's not enough just to pick stuff that's by authors, but also what is the substance of your conversation inside the class? And then that finally gets us to our last point up here, which are what are some resources that are out there? So let me just give you a couple of thoughts, and I'm going to identify a place for you to find some more resources. Um, I have a number of social media channels, um, davidmedia.org. i got podcasts, YouTube channels. Um, you're probably watching this on a YouTube channel, no doubt. And there are a couple of podcasts. I think one of them you would find really helpful if you work with tutoring programs and with small group discussion programs like supplemental instruction or uh, PLTL or any of the other ones that are out there. These are 10-minute interviews with study group leaders. I have five or six kind of generic questions that I ask, and then I just sit back and listen to these really smart study group leaders say how they process the material, what challenges they found with the course, uh, what is it that they're doing specifically during their sessions to make the sessions more accessible for all the students. They also share what is it that they are learning personally from this experience, and then they finish up with a suggestion uh, for study group leaders and for program managers uh, based on their experience. I think it's, I find it a lot of fun to interview these really sharp people. They are from Australia, Canada, and the United States. And eventually, when I finally get done, we'll finally be up to uh, 20 colleges. So we're talking about a lot of episodes. And I know of one program that actually assigns individual episodes, a couple of them, not all of them, but a couple of them, as homework for her study group program. And then ask the students to reflect about that interview in a blog posting. So that's a way to, in a meaningful way, integrate something like this into her training program because she thought that particular discussion 
or that particular interview with that student revealed some really good material and good suggestions for her tutors then. Uh, kind of one of my favorite little quotations here, two of them uh, from Yoda from Star Wars. I really think they're actually pretty profound. And that is making a commitment to change. It isn't that we're trying to, but we do. And we aren't going to do it all. And that's the reason why you have that second one down there at the bottom. The greatest teacher is failure is. And that's true. And I think about all of the failures of myself, all of the things that I think about, how I could have done things differently in study group management programs, about how I taught my own history course. At some point, you think about what is it that happened and then deal with the failure or deal with the fail because a fail is not the same thing as a failure. I'm working on a reflective uh, publication on that. I'm told that college students, this is a really big issue about whenever things don't turn out the way that they want them to, they get a bad grade, they have a bad experience. They see this as evidence that they're a failure. It's a characteristic about who they are rather than just simply an event and a fail, and we can learn from that and then not fail in the future. Well, I'm just kind of reflecting a little bit on my own here, I guess, for you. As we are finishing up here on the video, what are two things that you might do differently based off of today's material? And I would highly encourage you to go to the website, which is this one right here, www.arendale.org slash 2022-NYCLSA. And there is a treasure trove of material by other people. It's not me. It's the resources of others. There's my own personal website. If you want to see um, all of my resources for peer study group programs, well, there's the um, website for that. And I'm serious. Whenever I give you my email, and that's my cell phone uh, number here, I get calls from insurance companies, um, uh, you name it, salespeople throughout the day. You know, they're all trying to do their job, and they're out cold calling. Well, I'd much rather talk with you and see what I could learn from you and your lived experience on this topic. I have so much more to learn. I'm always nervous about doing these talks, but I hope that it fosters you to think about it more deeply, and I would love to read about and hear about what you're doing. So thank you for um, listening to the video today, and let's keep up the conversation. Take good care. Bye-bye.